with that in mind, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Titus as we attempt to uh, look at uh, the Christmas uh, Sunday message for today. And um, I certainly am, you know, mindful of, you know, every time a holiday season comes along, it does bring with it uh, all kinds of significant uh, added emotions. And uh, we are dealing with uh, the complexity of human uh, fragility uh, in a way that we perhaps have never had to in our lifetimes with this uh, global pandemic, with the political and social circumstances that are arising uh, among us. It is not lost upon uh, me, certainly, that although we are in our second year of COVID and we don't uh, keep public track of the kind of impact COVID is having, uh, more folks have died from COVID this year than last year. Amen. That uh, in the United States, uh, 2021 has been a more deadly year than the year 2020. And you can imagine that in year 2020, the first year of COVID, uh, so many of us were, you know, literally readjusting everything that we did in order to uh, bob and weave and dodge and 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 and, and get out of harm's way and. Uh, just like the culture of this country, a country that seems to be addicted to profit and uh, less worried about death, we have still uh, not slowed our lives down enough or made, I believe, enough accommodations from certainly a public health, but just a basic human standpoint to ensure that we are not continuing to lose loved ones uh, to preventable uh, diseases. And, and I, I say preventable diseases very uh, intentionally, because COVID is certainly uh, one preventable disease, but how many of you know that violence is another preventable disease? Amen. And we are losing so many loved ones to violence, intimate partner violence, uh, intracommunal violence, the violence that robs one another of our innocence and our 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 hope and our dreams, uh, the violence of capitalism and profiteering and war and racism and homophobia and transphobia and 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 sexism and 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 poverty amen all of these things are preventable and when we think of the the coming of Jesus the coming of Jesus at its core is about helping us to be free from a way of life that too often we have become addicted to it is about helping us to appreciate that uh, if there is never another interruption in history, the coming of Jesus is the interruption that brings to us the possibility of a new way of living. And if you're like me, uh, I need interruptions in my life. I need a little bit of a wake up call. I need an alarm. You know, see, you ever been in such a deep sleep and you you be meaning to wake up. And, and and like they say, the spirit be willing, but that old flesh, amen. That flesh be weak as I don't know what, amen. You, you, you uh, late to work, late, 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 late to school, late, late, late to pick up your kids, amen. Late, late. Late to your doctor's appointment, your dentist appointment, and you get there and you're just so disheveled and you were like, I wish someone had interrupted my sleep. So I wish I'd have set the alarm. Amen. Because, you know, I, 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 I know that we can get so overwhelmed that we can just remain in a place and state of status quo. But the interruption, the divine interruption is God's appearance to us. Theologically, we call this the incarnation. In uh, Catholic theology, they, they argue that the incarnation never stops happening, that God is always attempting to make God's self flesh in our lives. God is always attempting to remind you and I that although Mary, the dark-skinned Palestinian uh, unwed teenage girl that well, as theologically, we call it theotokos, the God bearer, literally. Although uh, there is only one Mary, how many know there are many Marys? Many God bearers of the divine gift of 
these interruptions. And so today, uh, I, I was struck by the lectionary passage uh, in the book of Titus. Titus was a, a, a disciple, a mentee of the Apostle Paul, who was attempting, as Paul was you know, making his rounds, he was attempting to, to, to figure out how can he live out this continuous incarnatability, if you will, of the gospel of Jesus. And, 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 and what I appreciate about this particular passage on this Christmas Sunday is that it demonstrates to me, and I hope to convey this to you and I, that whenever God gets ready to appear, God always gives us preparation time. God gives us the opportunity to have pronouncements that kind of, uh, uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It, 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 it gives you, uh, uh, oh, I have a word that my brain won't let come out, uh, but it, 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 it predisposes you to a kind of, 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 of seed, if you will, in your heart and in your mind. So when God shows up, when God appears, you are not altogether lost in the moment of God's appearing. Amen. You know, because sometimes if you are not prepared for an appearance, you will miss the full benefit of that appearance. And I'm not one of these people, you know, who want to get all the time surprised by God's appearance. I don't mind a surprise every once in a while, but too many surprises make my, you know, my heart palpitate. And the older I get, the less palpitations I want. Somebody say amen. <laughs> when I was young, oh, I loved the adrenaline rush, boy. Every roller coaster I wanted, I just want to be on it. And, and Nyla and the girl, they want to go on roller coasters. And I'd be like, you know, well, first, I can't fit on a roller coaster no more. But I'm going to get back to pre-corona weight so I can fit on a roller coaster. But the second reason is I can't take too many surprises. Well, I don't want to, to have the ultimate appearance of God in my life be diminished by me not being prepared, by me losing expectation. And so this particular passage in Titus chapter number two, I find to be quite significant. Uh, turn it into the screen if you like, or uh, just listen to the words. Titus chapter two, verse number 11, the scripture says, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. And it teaches us to say no to ungodliness, worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait. Somebody say, don't get tired of waiting. Say that, don't get tired of waiting. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us. Somebody ought to just holler. I'm glad I'm redeemed. Amen. Who redeems us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own. Pat yourself on the chest and say, I belong to God. Just say that I belong to God and are eager to do what is Good. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. And so uh, I'll, I'll talk for a few moments that appearances mean everything. Appearances mean everything. Bless the word of God that has been read for us. The people of God, we ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you and allow the power of your spirit that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest on me and even the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Now, you know, the appearances of God in the world are often misunderstood by those who first experienced them. And that if history has shown us anything, particularly in the life of the church, it is that our appear the appearances of God as they intersect with our senses will always require interpretation, reimagination. It will always require some participation. And then it must also help prayerfully 
prepare us for a future we have not yet fully realized. It is not lost on me that, you know, whenever we come around the holy days of the Christian tradition, whether it's Christmas or Easter, you know, there's always these History Channel, you know, documentaries about, you know, did Christmas, did Jesus, was Jesus really born? Did it happen in December? You know, was there really a manger? Uh, were, were there really wise men and stars? And, and, you know, I used to spend all kind of time in my apologetics classes getting all my nice little responses to all these kinds of inquiries. And then I realized that while some of those questions may be important to many, uh, what has become most important to me is what is the story of Jesus' arrival to humanity really about? I do believe Jesus' arrival is grounded in history, but I think it is not intended to be consumed by historicity more than it is intended to span the eternal dimensions of time and place. I mean, if it is indeed the case that the incarnation is about God making God's self material, to we who live in a material reality, then for the rest of our material existence, God will always be trying to get us to catch up to what God is doing. And so I am always enamored by the faithful expressions of those across time and place who have in a real time wrestled with what is at stake if we really believe Jesus has come. I mean, during the early uh, years of the church, it is certainly not a mystery that there were all kind of festivals that were in the Roman Empire that were elevating various different uh, gods and deities. And so the early Christians were trying to figure out how can we make sure that the Jesus that we have literally had resurrecting experiences with can be amplified and elevated amongst the pantheon of deities. And so they began to literally, Christmas means Christ mass, a gathering where we who believe in Christ can gather in celebration and acknowledgement of the story of Jesus coming and what it means. It means that Literally, the world has changed. Now, I want you to appreciate the radical claims of a little sect of Jewish folk in a big old empire uh, making a claim that the birth of one little dark skinned little Palestinian child in a in the in the 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 uh, 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 the outskirts of the Roman Empire, far away from the seat of power, this little child's birth has significance for this whole world. To us, that, you know, we're socialized to at least give it some hearing. But back then, they thought these folks were crazy. It's like people, babies are born every day. What is so significant about the birth of Jesus? And they began to create these festivals and services and opportunities to keep the story of this birth alive, along with the daily and weekly gathering of the believers in homes and the regular sharing of the Eucharist practices. Over thousands of years, the practices of Christmas, the practices of the affirming of the appearances began to gather much momentum in the imagination of those who claim to follow Jesus. That the appearances of Christ in our lives, they will always be followed with practices that solidify the impact of such appearances. But there is also this powerful articulation that I love to bring up uh, often during the Christmas message about the 18th century Christians who were a multiracial band of abolitionists who 
were here in the new world, <laughs> the colonized world, uh, during the time of Christ uh, Christmas, uh, it was recorded that uh, the debauchery and celebration of Christmas here by the, uh, the early, you know, 1700 quote unquote Christians from Europe that were here, it turned into a raucous blend of the July 4th and New Year's Eve. And so you have in the season of antebellum slavery, in the early days of American colonies, these, these multiracial band of anti-slavery Christian activists who realized that the way the American colonies were celebrating Christmas was not reminding anyone of the inbreaking of a new way of living, but it was actually bringing great shame. And so in 1834, militant black and white members of William Lloyd Garrett's new Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society created a Christmas holiday party to expose to the country that even though this country proclaims liberty, we have three million men, women, and children in shackles. These Boston abolitionist women were intent on financing their crusade against slaveholding elite that they began to organize Christmas fairs, listen to this, that sold and donated gifts at fundraising bazaars. And they used these fairs as a vehicle to drive home an anti-slavery message to raise money to support their abolitionist efforts. And then they began to adopt evergreen trees as a way to emphasize that our celebration must be about freedom and not bondage. The anti-slavery forces used their fairs to create a Christmas tree gift giving a uh, practice that rewarded children. And as the children drew listeners, or as the, the, the children were drawn to listen to these stories that proclaim that enslaved people ought not be uh, the objects of such vile behavior, particularly during a time when we as Christian colonies are supposed to be celebrating the coming of Jesus. It was aimed to sway others who practice slaveholding religion to realize that I cannot keep a slave and worship Jesus. Amen. By the end of the 1830s, the historical record says, abolitionists found their Christmas fairs had become the primary source of funds for all the work they would do throughout the year around abolitionism. And a famous British author, Harriet Martineau, she enthusiastically described and observed Christmas trees in her books, and it became an enduring figure and practice that whenever we wanted to have a powerful holiday symbol during Christmas, they would use evergreen trees. This symbol, this practice by some multiracial Christians in a antebellum slavery republic. 200 years ago, we don't even know that story. But yet, Christmas was used as a way to bring a divine appearance of what it means for Jesus to come. Child of God, I want you to know appearances mean everything. And I'm not just talking about the practices, but I'm also talking about the aesthetics, the way we assign beauty, the way we assign what has value. Aesthetics and practices are necessary for we who are attempting to continue to make the faithful expression of Christianity vibrant in a country where we see the rise of Christofascism the abuse of Christian faith to make the powers of death and bondage and violence normative in our lives. I want you to know, child of God, that uh, there is a reason why we must continue to depend on the appearances of Christ. 
Because without Christ's appearance, you and I could get seduced by false idols. By appearances that are not in the image of the uncreated one but appearances that would claim to be Christ, but they are actually reflections of fallen humanity. And I want you to know, in our culture today, there's a lot of reflections of fallen humanity that would love to describe themselves as appearances of Christ. But I love Dr. Carrie Day. I put this quote up, and, and, and she says that Jesus was not just conceived in a woman, he was conceived in the womb of a Palestinian Jewish woman peasant under a rogue state. God shows up in history in this particular way. How timely for the current political economic context we find ourselves in. And this image of, of, of they call them black Madonnas, the, 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 the idea that uh, Mary is a dark-skinned woman. There is a significance in these images becoming much more mainstream. One of our good friends, Dr. Christina Cleveland, is getting ready to publish her book uh, that is entitled God is a Black Woman. And she uh, has spent uh, the last two years on pilgrimages all through uh, Europe recovering the images of black Madonnas in other Christian societies. And that in other places all across the country, the image of Mary being a dark-skinned woman and Christ being a dark-skinned baby are normative. But in our country, Lord, have mercy. Folk get upset. They say, race don't matter. I say, then what you so upset about? Praise God. How many of you know appearances mean everything? And you and I must be people who are willing to embrace that there are moments where appearances, divine appearances, can interrupt our status quo in ways that reorder the way you and I live both in our own bodies, in relationship to the bodies around us, and certainly in light of the future that this new kingdom of God intends to break forward. And if you like me, I'm ready for a new kingdom, a new kingdom. I'm ready for a new way of life. Amen. That, 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 that can do away with some of these false realities that stand up as truth and stand up as righteous and stand up as faithful. No, I want to be one of these folks who have an appearance, as the scripture says, the first point that can bring salvation to all. That's the first thing I want you to understand. Appearances, they help bring salvation to all. Somebody holler, I'm saved. I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad I'm saved. But I want you to know that the scripture says the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. So it can't just be about you being glad that you are saved. I mean, be glad about it now. Man, you sing, so I'm so glad Jesus lifted me, singing glory, hallelujah. Be, be glad about it. But how many of you know that salvation is not just for you? That there has to be an appearance of God's grace to the world through our lives that invites everyone to tap into the salvation that has been made available to all. And in the story, I find it so fascinating. The, the, the gospel account is in Luke and you find the powerful stories of all these folks that had appearances in the lead up to Jesus' birth. Some call them epiphanies. Amen. Anybody ever had an epiphany? It's like I had an undeniable experience with Jesus. Folks say, well, you know, prove it to me. You say, I can't prove it in a, in, in a way you want me to, but, but I know that I, I, it's real. You ever had those kind of real experiences? Folk be laughing at you, be like, uh, you, you laughing, but I know what I'm talking about. I can't prove it with your, with your tools, but I know from my toes to my head. That this thing is real. You ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, it's real, it's real, it's real. And, and, and in the story, you saw Mary had an experience, an epiphany. Mary, minding Mary's own business. 
And all of a sudden, an appearance disrupted her life. Then Mary goes and hangs out with Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, minding her own business. And an appearance disrupts her life. Normal, everyday sisters, not looking for an appearance, but get one anyway. Somebody say salvation appears to all. I mean, that's not radical to us in this story because, you know, it's like, well, of course, uh, God would appear to women. But do you know in this day and time, the fact that in a first century document, you are telling me that the God of the universe is talking to women? Zachariah, Joseph, the husbands. <laughs> of these sisters trying to figure out why is God talking to you he ain't talking to me one of them don't believe the story so he lose his voice he walking around dumb can't talk because he could not appreciate that such a radical appearance could break a social norm Joseph was trying to get rid of Mary he had to have an appearance and the appearance for Joseph was so powerful that Joseph refused to follow a privilege he could use to save him some shame. I'm telling you, a divine appearance will make you change the course of your life. Shepherds out there minding their own business. They're not looking for God. They're the, they out there trying to keep their sheep from running off. Minding their business. Shepherds are the lowest class of workers in a society. This society particularly. And before Jesus shows up, they get one of the first pronouncements. What is that saying? It's saying that when God is getting ready to show up, God likes to start with ordinary people. When salvation appears to everyone, God don't start with the elite among us. Because too many of us are too smart to ascertain the appearances of God. So God will show up with some folk who got some superstitions. <laughs> who know that two plus two don't always equal four. I wish I could talk to somebody in here. God always show up in some other people's stories who are still unfinished and being cooked wise men God also though will find some of you seeking smart folks who practice different kinds of ways intellectually religiously and God will reveal God's self in your story God appears to creation now you know I'm not an animal guy you know I'm not one of these people who like pets and value trees and plants and all this kind of stuff because these folk need caretaking and I feel like if you ain't got a job and I ain't birthed you or we ain't birthed you then you got to pay your own way but I want you to know that in the story God appears to all creation to the animals, to the plants, to the trees. When I was over in Palestine, Israel, Palestine, and we were looking at trees that were thousands of years old. When I walked the road up to Mount Sinai, and I'm walking through the pathway, and they say these mountains are thousands of years old, and I just leaned up against one, and I just said to myself, man, Jesus leaned up against one of these mountains. God appears to all. Why? So all can be redeemed. And I want you to know, child of God, that it is in your interest to hold on to this truth. That God's appearances bring salvation to everyone. To everything. Not just to the people you like. Not just to the, the, the churches you feel comfortable in. Not to the just to the countries you pledge allegiance to. But God's salvation appears to all. And the question for us is, can all of us perceive God's appearances when God shows up? Can we train our hearts and our minds 
to appreciate when God is appearing. So the first question I want to ask you, how does God's appearance show us our need of salvation? Because when God appears, God will always reveal to you and I how much more growing we need, how much more saving we need. <laughs> How much more redeeming we need. God forbid that you get an appearance from Jesus and you can, you know, tell Jesus, well, you know, I got this covered. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. But, you know, I, 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 I've had enough of your appearances. You know, I don't have no need to prepare for anything. I don't have no need to, to fast, to pray, to ask forgiveness because, you know, I, I, I'm used to your appearance. No, 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 child of God. How many of you know when the appearance of Christ shows up in your life, it always gives you an opportunity to say, God, how in my life, in my family, in the world, are you attempting to save me from my sins? Oh, somebody holler, appear, appear, appear to me. The second thing that I think the scriptures lift up is that appearances teach us how Two, dot, dot, dot. You just, you just fill it in. Verse number 12, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, live self-controlled, upright, and godly in this present age. And I want you to know, some of us need to learn how to say no to the ways of this world that have gotten so perfected in death and, 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 and sickness and toxicity. The, 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 the appearance of Christ, it teaches you how to say no to the forces of racism, the forces of self-harm. It teaches you how to say no to those things in your life that continue to erase the imago dei, the image of God in you and in others. It teaches you to say no to those things that keep you dependent on that which cannot bring you life. And I want you to know, child of God, that for many of us, we must invite the appearance of Christ so we can learn some things we do not yet know. I mean, think of all the, the many people in these stories who, who, who had what they thought the best information up to date. But when Jesus injects Jesus' self in their life, everything that they thought was settled became up for question. They began to ask themselves that uh, Jesus showing up means that literally the world is changing. What I, who I thought was the king is now a servant in the kingdom of God. Who I thought was a servant has now been elevated to a place of honor. That Jesus showing up brings a great reversal. Lord, have mercy. And I want you to know that for many of us, uh, we need to learn how to say no to some forces, to some sensibilities, to some ideologies that continue to cause you to believe that the way of this world that loves to commodify, colonize, subsume, to conquer, these ways are not the ways of Jesus. These ways are the ways of the Antichrist. They're the ways that have literally brought all of creation to our knees. We're wondering why is there so much sickness in the world? It's because there is so much propaganda and wickedness in the world. Folk running away from solutions that could bring them healing. Folks are holding on to lies rather than the truth. You got us uh, destroying the literal ecosystem that is supposed to provide us with clean water and air. And yet when you talk to folk about it, they act like they the ones being violated. Hey Amen. I can't ever forget the time we were in Flint, Michigan, and we were responding to the lead in the water. And the folk who actually contaminated the water were not willing to be accountable for the harm that they done. And they in meetings would claim that they are being treated unfairly while you have black folk in Flint with literal uh, skin diseases and lead puncturing through their skin. And it caused me to say to myself, what kind of wickedness is teaching us to think that profits and companies and systems are more important than people, lives and families? Lord, I feel like preaching about an appearance today. 
but you ought to tell yourself that this appearance of Christ will teach me that I must say no to ungodliness. Somebody holler no. That I must say no to the forces of evil. Somebody say no. That I must say no to those factors that bring death rather than life. Somebody say no. And I must begin to ask myself that in light of the grace of God that has appeared to all, Lord, then I then have to say no to some folk who are trying to give me a gift that's actually a curse. I have to make some folk earn the right to give me a gift. Amen. Amen. Just because you offer me a gift don't mean I got to take it. Huh? Because you can tell me that this thing's a gift till I open it up. And it'll be the worst thing I've ever put my hands on. I don't know if you ever been in a situation. I ain't going to go down too far your memory lane. Amen. But some of us know that every gift you get ain't worth taking. Every advice you hear ain't worth following. Some of us need to have a little bit of a discriminatory discerning ear about what I receive into my heart. I will not be taught by the devil. I will not be taught by my enemy. I will not be taught by the wicked when I have a teacher whose grace has appeared to all. Lord, free me from the giver of gifts uh, that want to have strings attached to everything. Uh, free me from the giver of gifts uh, that want my to their toxicity to be a prerequisite for me taking their gift. Uh, free me from the giver of a gift uh, that will only see me as their dependent uh, rather than a self-agent of the Most High God. Uh, I need uh, to be taught by the grace of God. Uh, that has appeared unto everybody. And that's why I'm glad that when the gift comes, it will teach me how to live. It will teach me how to wait. Because they that wait on the Lord. I feel a little preaching in here. They shall have some renewed strength. Some of us got to learn how to wait. While I'm going through my trial, while I'm waiting on the appearance of the Lord, I will wait on God, the one that brings me strength. I know that I will get strength when God shows up. So I'm not going to move until God shows up. But I'm going to wait on the Lord. Lord, and be of good courage because I know he will strengthen my heart. The appearance of God, it will help me to know how I ought to live, how I ought to prepare, how I ought to be formed in a world that wants to destroy my life, wants to destroy my mind. Uh, wants to break up my heart. Uh, but the grace of God uh, has appeared to everybody uh, who's willing to have a listening ear. Uh, and I know that if I can listen for the appearance of God, uh, the scripture says while we wait uh, for the blessed hope of the appearing uh, of the God of our salvation, uh, that God will introduce some hope. Uh, do I have anybody in the building who's had a good dose of hope lately? Uh, do I have somebody uh, who can say God is my hope? Uh, God has given me a vision. Uh, God has given me some eyes uh, that while I go through this trial, uh, while I endure COVID season, uh, while I have transitions, uh, while I deal with death in my life, uh, God will. God will give me some hope uh, that'll keep me going one step uh, after another. Uh, I dare you today, uh, look for the appearance of God uh, during this Christmas season. Uh, he may come in your horrible pit. Uh, he may come in your mountaintop experience. Uh, he may come in your everyday life. Uh, but appearances, uh, they mean everything. Uh, Show up, God, in my life. 
Show up, God, in my family. Show up, God, in my body, in my relationships, in my dreams, in my family, in my children. Show up. And remind me that your appearance means everything. God's appearance means everything. You may be Mary and Elizabeth in this story. Just some sisters minding your own business. <laughs> I want you to know God wants to show up in your life. You may be the shepherds, the, the regular everyday class working folk. You just out here minding your business. I want you to know Jesus is getting ready to hop up in your office cubicle. In your hospital room. You may be the partner of some of these folk out here. And your faith may not be as strong as theirs. God wants to show up in your life, your children's lives. You may be the educated of the educated, the elite among us. And you've been able to outthink your need for God, your need for epiphanies, your need for miracles and unexplained phenomena. I want you to know God really wants to show up in your life. Woo! Do I have anybody that knows that an appearance means everything come on stand with me everybody lift those hands to the lord song that we sang earlier said oh come let us adore him adoration follows the appearance of the one who is worthy to be worshiped so we lift up our hands to you today. Oh, oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore Cry. Come on, lift those hands. Come on, say it again. Oh, come, let us adore. Say it again. Oh, come, let us. Say it again. Oh, come, let us adore. He's Christ, for he alone is worthy, say, for he alone is worthy. We lift our hands to you today and say it, God, for you alone. Yeah, yes, for you alone are worthy. See your Christ, hey, the Lord. God, right now in the building and even in our virtual sanctuary, we lift our hands to you today. On this Christmas Sunday, we need an appearance from you. We need appearances in our neighborhoods where gun violence is taking the lives of so many. We need an appearance of you in our families, our marriages with our children, where trauma and brokenness is winning, Lord God. We need appearances from you, God, on our jobs where toxicity and abuse, Lord God, it's carrying the day. We need appearances from you, God, in our mind, where depression and anxiety Lord God, are running rampant. We need appearances from you in our bodies, Lord God, where sickness and illness 
continues to disproportionately visit us. We need appearances from you everywhere, God. Show yourself. Somebody say, show yourself, God. Say it again. Show yourself, God. Help me to be, Lord God, not surprised by the appearance you seek to make. Help me to not be surprised by the appearances you continuously introduce. But God, when you show up, may I say, here am I, Lord. May I embrace the lessons you're seeking to teach me. May I reflect the salvation that is appearing. And may I embrace salvation for myself. Oh, somebody say, I receive salvation. Say that I receive it. I receive it. God, I receive your salvation today. I do not want to be lost. Hallelujah. In the wickedness of this world. But God, I need your salvation. Save me from my sins. Somebody say, save me from my sins. Save me from my, Lord God, inhibition. Save me from those things that keep me from trusting your voice, from following, hallelujah, your guidance. Save me, God. Heal me, God. On this Christmas Sunday, make me brand new. And we'll say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the appearances that mean everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on and give the Lord a hand. Praise everybody. Hallelujah. We thank God. We thank God. Oh, bless the name of the Lord. Amen. Well, God bless you, people of the way. I, 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 I just give somebody a fake high five. Maybe I don't know. To tell them, you know, unless you came with them, you can hug them and say your appearances mean everything. Amen. We, we, we want you all to, to know that although the holidays can be hard, they can also be an opportunity in your hardship, in your grief, in your times of feeling lonely and isolated. Invite an appearance from the Almighty God. How many know you can be alone but not lonely? Amen. So invite the appearance of God to meet you. And I pray here at The Way, whether you're in person or virtually, if you find yourself in a lonely place, there's some God bearers in here. Some folk who don't mind standing next to you because no child of God should ever be alone when you're part of the community of God. Amen. Amen. So let's 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 stay together. Let's be together. Let's be safe. Let's love one another. Don't take for granted this season. Sometimes, you know, Christmas and the holy days, holidays become so commercialized that they are robbed of their spiritual significance. Don't let anybody take the power of Christ coming out of your life. How many know it's made all the difference, amen? It's made all of the difference.